pardon me. Great game at your table. This is Jonathan Alvin, and this is Game Master Soapbox on Necros RPG. And we're just getting started tonight. I don't know how long I will be on air, nor do I know how many people will come and talk to me. I intend to be here at least for an hour, but we will see whether or not I can maintain that pace. And today I want to talk about the different reasons why you, in particular, play role-playing games. If you are on Twitch.tv and you are watching Nikos RPG's Game Master Soapbox, then you are uh, ostensibly already a person interested in role-playing games. So I may be only preaching to the choir here, but I really am looking for answers to the question of what, in particular, are your reasons for being a role player. I put up a list of them here and I'll be going over them uh, over the next few minutes to kind of give you an overview outline. And I uh, anticipate to basically stay on more as a uh, survey sort of for what types of reasons people play in games and maybe get a kind of an idea of the, the direction, if you will of role-playing today, and this is not necessarily a subject that is, you know, a burning question to the majority of people in the world, but it definitely is a burning question to me because there has been a weather change in the number and type and quality of people that have been playing role-play games over the years, and it's been a rather interesting ride watching the change and the direction of game game players shift. And so I'd like to kind of explore that a little bit today. And so if you are a role player and you are watching today and you want to be a part of the conversation, the uh, chat box, the uh, chat room is open and feel free to enter. I'm going to be doing my traditional introduction to the chat by inviting you to hop on and feel free to type any question you want to. Uh, although I am setting this up to talk about the reasons why you play role play games. Maybe you've got some comments you'd like to give as far as how you see role play today and what you would like to um, talk about as well. So I'm very open to that. So Getting started, we're talking about why to play role play games. Well, the, one of the main reasons is that there has been a considerable amount of public attention to it with the release of the Dungeons and Dragons movie, Honor Among Thieves, and the recent uh, hubbub over the Dungeons and Dragons uh, licensing issues and the direction of the property as Hasbro moves it into its next phase of development whether they call it 5.5 or 2.5.2 uh, .2 or uh, D and D one, those are all you know just different terms. I got an issue with this thing just being off just a hair, driving driving me crazy. So There we go. Alrighty, so one of the one of the most common reasons people play today, and one of the reasons you might be here, is curiosity. You're not sure what a role play game is like, and curiosity can be a powerful motivator. Whether it's simply to motivate you to sit down to experience it, or if it's you know wanting to see the limits to which it operates and what is possible, what is not. Uh, for example, in my, in my Monday group uh, this last week, we had a couple of young ladies who stuck their head in and asked if we, what we were doing, and we explained we were playing a role-playing game and invited them to come in and sit down. They felt, I think, a little pressured to do so because so many people were there. It was a relatively large group. We had eight players, and so adding the two more of them would have brought us to ten. And we tried to ramp them up into the game pretty quickly, but the, there was such enthusiasm by the players and such excitement to have new players sitting at the table that there was a uh, kind of a 
tension or a pressure put on them such that literally at a at a specific point their phones both rang and they both left so i think we think that they probably just called each other because they wanted out of there so there are times when curiosity is not quite enough of an attractor but for the most part people want to go want to come and see what it's all about they've heard you know hints and rumors and they've seen references to it on different television programs and they've seen it in movies and so they just want to to find out what it's all about and so uh at least at some initial level curiosity can be a major driver to getting people to sit down for a role play game because they honestly don't know what it is that they're getting into and just simply want to explore and figure it out figure it out uh, maybe instead you come to role-playing games knowing full well what it is and you're simply wanting to escape from the world that you're in. The, the challenges of our daily lives can sometimes be a burden and a challenge and a problem and we look for a way to get past it or live in a realm where that problem doesn't exist. And so maybe you just want to uh, understand or appreciate an alternate reality that can be, a, again, a pretty heavy driver, especially if you live a pretty high pressure, high stress life. I would know that when I was in sales, role playing was a great escape for me because I could, you know, actually smash the monsters with the sword instead of just trying to get them to make a, make an, you know, make them, get them to make a deal. And so escapism is certainly one direction. And the, one of the major, uh, factors that plays into that is that if the imagination and your creativity has you put together uh, the idea of escaping from this world, that means you know what it is from which you are trying to escape and therefore you are trying to make the world a better place, at least within the, um, the escapist environment. Now, pardon me for the, the brush off there. I've got a bit of fuzz on my lens. Anyway, this leads, of course, uh, to the next level of that, which is wish fulfillment. Many people are so doggedly frustrated with the world they're in that they are looking for a different, better world where the things that they wish would happen actually do instead of the things that they don't want to happen that actually do. So this wish fulfillment is arguably one of the more prob problematic of the reasons to play role-playing games because when you have a need for your wish to be fulfilled, if you have a need for a different reality, it's awfully hard to ensure that the game master is going to carry it forward exactly as you wish. So even in a wish fulfillment environment, you may not you know, get everything you want. And that can be, of course, a problem if that's the reason for playing. So... I think there are a large number of people that enter role-play games with a wish fulfillment trigger in their brain. They've read up on the subject and they've looked at websites that have told them optimal builds and all this kind of thing to tell them what they need to do to have a, quote, winning game combination because they have in their head this idea that role-play games can be, or you can be a winner or a loser in role-play games, and therefore they're trying to become <clears throat> the success in the fantasy world that they're not in this world. Now, this can be a positive thing. I mean, you may actually have in your mind the idea of, of heroics that you want to be the savior of the world, that you want the things you do to matter, which leads towards the path of heroics. But there are a lot of people that are stuck in just simply the wish fulfillment because they've read someplace that the optimal build is to have three levels of this and two levels of that, and they want to see it actually play out that way. And not all game masters are the same, not all stories are the same, and so it doesn't necessarily completely scratch the itch, and so therefore they change game masters or change systems or whatever because they're trying to get to this better world, this perfect place. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about heroics, there are some people who literally have heard the the positive press about role play games and they've watched movies like lord of the rings and hawk the slayer uh, game of thrones etc 
and they want to be able to do the heroic things. They want to, you know, bungee jump off of a cliff and not die. You know, there are many of us that, that, um, have this to a limited extent, but there's some people who have it to a greater extent. I have a, a very good friend I've talked about before, uh, by the name of Scott, who is in a wheelchair and will be for the rest of his life. And he doesn't make a big deal out of it, but for him, there's, a something joyful about free mo free movement mobility being able to get around ride a horse you know jump over a fence climb through old tunnel these these are all things that he would never ever do and so being able to do so in a heroic fashion in the game it feeds his need to save the world and i think to a greater extent we all everybody who is a game game player is looking for a way to change the world. We want to make it a better place. Uh, we want to make it a safer place. We want to destroy the tyrants and quell the uh, dangers and make, uh, make it so that no one ever has to starve, no one else ever has to suffer. And these are all noble causes that will drive a person to play a role-playing game because it is the one place in the unit to play, as the saying used to go, people out there that want to watch the world burn. And they really step into a role-play game from the standpoint of a video game player, sort of, that they are just wanting to see whether or not they can break the system. They want to see whether or not they can uh, create situations that are untenable for the storyteller to, do, to proceed with. Maybe they are looking for um rules that seem to be inane or stupid to them and they want to stop them or if simply they just literally want to destroy whatever it is the storyteller is creating make make it their own or or overwrite the world they may even just simply want to watch it burn and watch the poor game master crumble i've i've known situations where i've had to take away the fun from everybody else because for them that was the fun of destroying other people's impressions of the world and the game environment. They literally want to find out what the limits are when the game master is going to say, no, I can't do any more. That's as far as I'm going to go or whatever. <clears throat> now, we'll go to more positive angles. Some people just want to improve their ability for creative visualization. So they play, especially in a theater of the mind game like Nikos RPG, you're going to be looking at things through your mind's eye, not necessarily through visuals. There isn't necessarily going to be a map of where the players are and where they are in reference to each other. And so you've got to track that within your brain, which makes your visualization, visualization skills improve. <clears throat> Some people want to do that just so they can do a better job of telling stories themselves. On a day-to-day -day basis, every one of us is a storyteller, whether we like it or not. And being able to think about a story on a broader scale will automatically improve your ability to visualize it. And if you can visualize it better, then you can describe it better. And in describing it better, you're then becoming a better communicator. <clears throat> uh, associated with that also are those that want to expand their imaginative range. If you play in a, if you know, if you live in a workday world where um, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer and they a uh, system is unequal and there is, you know, all kinds of inequities. You want to go to a place where you can actually imagine things being done by regular people that actually have meaning. And so by expanding their imaginative range, they now can understand and comprehend the actions of other people, perhaps better, which makes them better communicators as well. And then ultimately, the, the final one that I've listed here is the idea of connection, sharing, and belonging. We all want desperately to be a part of something. We all want to connect with other people. It's just in our nature. Human beings are social in nature and want to be a part of a community. And role-playing games is a great place to start because those players are going to be there together week over week, engaging in a story that they all collectively are part of, and therefore, it's automatically something to which you can belong and have meaning 
within the parameters of the game session. So with, with that, the understanding, therefore, is that we are better at being because we can become better at being connected and being part of something else. And uh, this, all of this is really just a, ref, a, a, a conversation about the, the why, you know, what it is that, that you, go, you come to a role-playing game for. And we can, uh, in the next section, we, we can go over the same points, but we can do it from a different angle. Because when we talk about why you want to play, we can talk about wh where the motivation for that one comes from. All right, so we're going to go through all eight of these points again, but we're going to go from the standpoint of not just why do you play role play games, but why is this the reason you play role play games? All right. So we're going to talk about why you play role play games. And this is Jonathan Alvin with Nikos RPG. And this is the uh, Game Master Soapbox. And we are talking about the reasons that people play role play games. And we're going to talk about the reasons in a little bit more depth this time. We're going to actually be talking about the motivations to play and where those motivations come from. So first of all, curiosity. Sounds obvious, right? We just want to know something. So we, we, we play role-playing games because we're curious. But it can be more than that. It can actually be... My fuzziness come, came back. It may be that my table's not stable. But... So if we look at it the curiosity from a slightly different angle, the curiosity could be, why do you want to play role-play games? You're curious, but you're curious about what might be the parameters, what rules are static in this universe, what rules are bendable, what things can we do that we wouldn't be able to do in another environment. And so curiosity Beyond just being the knee-jerk, I want to know what's going on and what they're doing over there in a the role-play game, can actually be, I play because I'm a curious person and I want to know more about the lore. I want to know more about the mechanics. I want to know more about how the interplay occurs. And this level of curiosity is much stronger and much more resilient because it's not going to be answered with a knee-jerk response. You're not going to sit down and go, oh, these are a bunch of geeks who, who like talking fantasy. That is that that is not the kind of curiosity we're not talking about. We're talking about curiosity where you are genuinely interested in what's going on at the table, and therefore you're going to start to expand your curiosity into other frameworks. You're going to say what is possible in this game time. What is possible, probable? What could I do? What kinds of uh, limitations will the universe place on me? Well, next would be escapism. And yes, we can talk about, I simply want to get away from my nine to five. I want to get away from the, who themselves have a need to escape. And, and this necessity for escapism has also to do with uh, the, uh, the idea that the world that we are in cannot be altered. It can't be changed. The things that we do, it doesn't matter how long you stand on a cor street corner and shout. No one's going to hear you unless they choose to. And therefore, your ability to attack the world is limited. Whereas in a role you can truly escape to, maybe the rules there will allow you to change the world. Maybe you will be able to escape the... Uh, limitations of this world and live in that other space. I have one of my players, Gene, has been with me for almost almost a dozen years. And one of the key points that she always says is that she exists here on Earth, but she lives in Nikos. Her persona, her personality, her life is in a place where things have meaning and things depend on her. And that she can influence. And this kind of level of escapism is more than just, you know, avoiding, you know, 
what do they call it, uh, conflict avoidance. Instead of conflict avoidance, it's conflict engagement because you're able to change the world through those actions. And therefore, the escapism is not necessarily an escapism from, it can be an escapism to this alternate reality where things are better than they are here. Now, a lot of people fall into the wish fulfillment, but I want to talk about that a little bit different here. We are talking about why wish fulfillment. Well, the number one why is that this world is unforgiving. This world that we live in has absolute limits. You can't get what you want. You can't become something beyond your capacity. You cannot, you know, you, one does not merely walk into Mordor. You can't just walk into the world and have everything go your way. So a game environment is a great place for wish fulfillment. And this wish fulfillment can be, again, graduated across a bunch of different tiers. Why use wish fulfillment? Well, one of the primary reasons to use wish fulfillment is this means that you are focused on a task, a goal, an objective. That wish, that thing you're trying to accomplish, is a tangible, physical thing. And when you live in a real world that is un unforgiving, there's no way you can ever achieve it. You can only hope to someday uh, have a legacy of trying, but you can never actually change the world. But yet in a world where wish fulfillment occurs, you can actually push those boundaries to make the world follow the path you want. And if a game master is compliant with it, you can change the entire universe, the entire play environment as well. Now, the next part, heroics. A lot of us have been in situations in our lives where we were cho we were given the opportunity to be heroic, to be the better man, to take the high road, and we failed. And we can't do anything about that. But in the fantasy setting, we can decide that we're, this is what's important to us, and we can instead provide the role of heroics with a good positioning because we are aware of the limitations and the restrictions, but we're also aware of what our capabilities and possibilities are, and therefore we can achieve this, the, the heroic status. Most game masters have as an objective for the players to become, become the global champions, to be the recognized celebrities of the world they live in, and being able to give the players the engine and the players are able to take that engine and move down that path towards that level of heroics allows them not only to save the world, but for them to be, to be rewarded for their efforts in a world where that is honored. Now, I'm going to speak next on the one that probably sounds like the, the hardest one. And, and it, what it really is, is the, to me, the, breakover point, and that is the world breaker. If you came into a game session explicitly to destroy the environment and the ambiance and the connectiveness of the players, then you probably shouldn't be playing a role-play game. Go play miniatures. Um, but on the other hand, there are people who enter with a world breaker mode, not that they're trying to destroy the universe, but they're trying to find where the boundaries are in a very solid, tangible way. And I say to you, if that is the case, if you are there to try to find the limits of the game, then you should be looking at becoming a, a game master yourself and stepping away from the table as a role player. Because a world breaker mentality is literally ignoring the role playing aspect. You're, you're stepping away from the persona as a as an actual person in the, in the game world, and instead are using it as a device, like a pry bar, to tweak and, and bend at the edges of the world and try to, you know, undermine it, defeat it, or improve it. Either which way, the the idea of the world breaker is that you're now to the level of meddling, so to speak, and is not necessarily 
going to be helpful to the group. Now, there are times when everybody's a world breaker. You can have a very, very well-defined bad guy who deserves to be put in the, you know, put down, put in the ground, whatever. And so you have players that you will want to be world breakers for a time. But the very idea of a world breaker as a play style is counterintuitive to a role play game. So I only mentioned here because there are times when a person should be considering the transition and look at the possibility of being the uh, game master instead of the player. Just a second. We're pretty close to my commercial break anyway, so probably on commercial right now. Anyway, well, that's well, that's percolating. We'll continue. Um, now, if you came to if you come to role, role play games, you and you, your your reason, your why playing role play games is to improve creative visualization. This can be from a various a variety of different sources. Perhaps you're uh, picking up improved creative visualization because you yourself are a storyteller and you want to learn experiential tools that will make you a better storyteller. Perhaps you have um, difficulty in communicating with people in your life and so you're looking for uh, ways to describe things that is more clear and more understandable and can reach more people. Uh, maybe you simply want to have a better play experience. Theater of the Mind arguably is one of the better environments for role-playing because it provides the uh, players with the ability within their own mind and their own creative skills to take on the task of defining what the world looks like or take on the task of understanding where they are in, in the fight scene or whatever. So improving creative visualization can be simply selfish. You simply want to have a better ability to visualize. Maybe you simply want a better way to articulate. But I like to think that some people come to the game specifically because they are looking for ways to improve their own uh, development over time and they want to create a a skill in descriptiveness that makes their effective life better. For example, I have some friends who are in the real estate business and one of the best things that he ever said to me was that role playing in my game worlds made the world more real. He could do more work in selling, describe it in terms that felt more tangible, like they were actually on the scene of the the game as itself. And I hope my screen isn't freezing. I noticed that my personal screen does freeze from time to time, but I hope it's not interfering with my video. Anyway, I'll obviously check that afterwards. Um, now, next would be expanding your imaginative range. And this really is a matter of the level of fantasy in which you find yourself in a role play game. In certain cases, the game master is very literal, very, you know, visual, tangible, descriptive, but he's not taking you to any place of great imagination. The players then therefore have to expand that imaginative circle by activating magical effects or using magical items that have certain tri triggers. The idea here is that the expanding the imaginative range stems from our ability to get out of our comfort zone, get out of the framework. For example, the very idea of flight, you know, the idea of I'm going to you know, become airborne in an area where I've been traditionally two-dimensionally on the ground and all of a sudden now I can be 25 feet in the air and interacting with everything I can see which is a expanded circle of vision, but I'm also more likely to be the target of, of other effects because I'm now visible. 
it becomes a matter of expanding the realism of the scene, but also taking that and internalizing that into the realism of the played out portion of the scene, if that makes sense. Now we'll come back to our commercial in just a minute. So it says we went to commercial, but it didn't start my commercial timer. So I don't know how that's going. So. If you're on the channel and I'm not, I'm not in commercial, feel free to uh, mention it. So I'll know to continue. I'm not sure how long a commercial break that one is because it didn't specify. I'm going to assume another 22 seconds. There we go. Oh, now it's going to the last commercial. So yet another minute. Alrighty, welcome back from the commercial break. This is Jonathan Albin. We're on uh, Nikos RPG. I'm talking about Game Master Soapbox and why you might role play, play role play games. And we're near the end of the second time through. And this one, we're talking about the reasons and what the reasons are for the reasons. So, for example, uh, in the last one here, we're going to be talking about connection, sharing, and belonging. Certainly, if there's a knee-jerk response of, yeah, if I sit down at the table and I become part of this games group, that's that's a sense of belonging. But more than that, if you are role-playing your character with that purpose, then your character's action is going to be to be more connected, to be more uh, communicative and want to pursue ways for his character, his, you know, your persona to become more directly involved with the group with which he is affiliated. This idea of using a connection or sharing as your motivation as you play, in addition to its motivation for your gameplay, is really kind of fun and, 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 and interesting because what it does is it causes you to think about the connection between the characters and the the story, the players, and the situation. And having a level of connectiveness, a, le a level of interaction with the story gives the player a depth because they are not just going through motions, but they're contemplating what those, that those actions might mean to the overall story. This is important when you're talking about a long-term group. If you're running a week over week session over session uh, saga where the player's actions can in fact can affect the world and the uh, world's actions can be changed it makes for a much more dynamic place for the the character to be and so if that's the case then you have a greater opportunity to make the changes in the world you want so now that we've gone through the uh, motivations and we've talked about why people play, I'd like to get your feedback too. If you are watching and you have want, want have some input on why you play role play games, I'd love to discuss it because each person brings to the table different things. I I could go through the list again this time, referring to specific people. Uh, 
with, without names, because I we don't need to do that. But the idea is to talk about different actual persons that you've had at your table that uh, typified each of these and what, what they were doing there and how they impacted the game. So that's what we're going to do in this third time through of talking about why do you play role play games. I'm going to talk about why people use these motivations and how that affected the game they were in. So we're going to start off right now with curiosity. And there are a hundred people that sit down to play role play games and my gate groups on Monday and Tuesday at the board game paradise store in Redlands, California uh, are filled every week with brand new players. I have every session I have between two and five new players each week that are learning the basics of role play. Uh, they may or may not stay with my groups. They, the group size is an accordion. It goes up and down over time. But the primary reason people want to play is curiosity. Maybe they heard it on an episode of Big Bang Theory or they watched an episode of the old um, community TV program where they played role play games. Maybe there's uh, those that were, of course, drawn in by uh, the episodic Stranger Things. All of these are things that cause curiosity and therefore the player who sits down can be sitting down for that level of curiosity. But if they stick, if they stay week over week, then more than likely what they're developing is a different sense of curiosity. And that is what is going on in this fantasy realm. How did it come to be this way and how can we change it? Man, this lens is driving me crazy. So, uh, in particular, I had a player sit down um, who had never played a role play game before. And they were curious about how role play games worked. And so we built a character in a way that was role playing. In other words, I didn't just have them sit down and roll dice because that doesn't always work for everybody. But instead, we started out with a uh, situation and they made a decision. And the decision they made meant that we had to test a certain attribute. And then we rolled up that attribute and then we moved on to the next one. So that the very characteristic that built their character was itself the engine for all of the other pieces that explained to them what role play was, how role play worked, what they were what was expected of them in a very visceral way because they were actually playing from second one in the session. And so being able to embrace your curiosity and have that uh, fed from the very first moment is really, really useful. Uh, this person went on to be a chronicler for one of our episodic series and uh, to this day still occasionally pops in to the uh, chat and, and talks with us about the games that they're running and that kind of thing and how the gameplay when they first started drew, drew, drew them to the game that they are now playing with us. So Of course, when we talk about escapism, the uh, idea of escaping life and jumping into a role play game to uh, get back at the universe or pay back the universe or whatever, that's all, you know, one level. But if we go to the next level, that, a, that the player is playing a character who is escaping wanting to get out of the reality that they're in into an alternate reality. This means, therefore, that the player has to basically disregard the things that are similar to this real world. So if you are running a game and a person is going to be the escapist at your table, sometimes they are going to do damage to the overall story because they're even wanting to avoid any coherency because what they're really looking for is uh, scratching the itch of really wish fulfillment. They want they want the world to be different and they are pursuing it in an aggressive and, and arguably da uh, potentially damaging way. But 
when a player comes to the table with escapism in mind and then internalizes it as their motive, then they're really looking for ways to understand the world and the rules thereof and thereby find ways to fix it. Uh, for example, I, I had a group for a while that were totally involved in the game from an escapist standpoint. And when reality in, in, uh, imposed itself on their fantasy, they chose to take a path of destructiveness where they would choose to basically undermine any governmental system that I described if it was supportive of a status quo uh, reality. And thereby they started changing the world by simply taking out the people that would have disagreed with them. So the, the escapism therefore doesn't necessarily be a bad thing. It just has to be monitored and mo uh, mollified by other things to keep them on course, so to speak. Now, wish fulfillment, that one's, a lot of people just sit down at the table because they are used to playing a role play game where they are um, a tune, a two dimensional object or being played on a two dimensional tabletop. And therefore they don't have any expectation that what they are doing is going to affect the world. And they want to perhaps be in a wish fulfillment status where the things that they do have great impact or not, they may be simply wanting to see what, what they can do to force the GM to put their character into death saves or whatever. So the idea of wish fulfillment can be destructive, but if they come in the situation of wish fulfillment with the idea of using it their, that as their motivation, then they are pursuing a course of trying to solve the puzzle, get to the conclusion, achieve the goals, uh, become the hero, if that's possible, uh, put down the villain, you know, stop, the, stop the tyranny or whatever. <clears throat> and so therefore, wish fulfillment can be a positive thing. It's just a matter of turning the focus to wish fulfillment within the frame compared to wish fulfillment that disregards the frame. The idea, too, that you would want to become a hero at one level, that's what you know, that's what role-play games are knee-jerk supposed to be about, right? You are the heroes, the adventurers. But what if you're really wanting to be the exemplar? You're wanting to be the, you know, not just the hero, but the hero that is lauded and approved of and awarded and recognized. This level of heroics is definitely something that a game master can feed into and support and help a player to develop. But the point there is that the story that's being developed has to still be the original story because if the players are starting to change it, now they're starting to fall into the concept of being the world breaker. And again, world breaker can carry two, two connotations. Most common world breaker is the YOLO, the you only live once, you only get one chance, you, get, you can do crazy things until you're dead, so be crazy. Um... To me, the, the key to handling that or revising or making that work with, within the game is to turn the YOLO into WOLO. And that is, we only live once. So if you're going to go down, you're taking your party of adventurers with you and they are all on board to be just as crazy as you are. In which case, then the storyteller can therefore modify and change the story so that the adventuring groups destructiveness is actually focused on the purpose and the intent of the story in the first place. And I already did a video on how to do that, so I'm not going to go into that now. But the idea here is that the world breaker motive can still be a positive thing if all you're trying to do is prove where the boundaries are, prove where the world has its solution and where it doesn't. Now, Next, we're going to talk about improving visualization. And a player who comes to the table to visualize is there for the dialogue. He's there for the descriptions and the feedback and the entire communications process. And therefore, 
there's going to be an improvement in all aspects of role play when your players are working on developing better visualization. They're asking questions. They're asking for clarification. They are expressing uh, their position in terms of relative positioning and things like that, saying, if I can do this, then I'm doing that. Because this gives feedback to the storyteller about how he's describing to make sure that he improves his skills over time, which therefore increases the ability to visualize and see the scene and internalize it. And both of these lead to an expanded imaginative range because you are expanding not only your ability to see it yourself, but to communicate what you're seeing to another person to make it more tangible and real for all the participants, which makes the theater of the mind games go so much better. <clears throat> now, finally, ultimately, we're coming down to uh, the end of my one hour show. And uh, as yet, I haven't had any comments, so feel free to leave any questions or comments or whatever so that I can respond to those because I, I prefer to have this in a dialogue format than rather than in a monologue. But when we're talking about this last part of connection, sharing, and belonging, if a player comes in with both feet and he wants to become a part of the community, he's going to play his character in a way that it becomes part of the community as well. The idea of the injunction, the idea that your persona is there whether you're there or not, is only as useful as it is for the players to step into and out of that role. And so therefore, by having a connected character, a person who understands and appreciates where the story is going and pays attention to wit, what is going on in the game, gives the player and the group stronger standing. So, in essence, why you play role-playing games can be any one of these or a mixture. And then my question to you, if you're watching, is tell me a little bit about what it is you... What brought you to role-play games? Why did you start playing? What kinds of questions did you ask that you would like the games masters to answer? And what, what kinds of uh, responses in game would you expect? As we're finishing up the show, I want to thank, uh, thank you guys for watching every week. Uh, Nikos RPG wouldn't exist without you, so make sure if you appreciate what you're seeing that you follow the channel on Twitch. You also go to YouTube and at Nikos RPG. Uh, subscribe there. It doesn't cost a penny, and you can get more appreciate, uh, get more awareness of when I'm creating new videos. And also, I want to thank you if you've made any comments, because one of the best ways I can know to to improve is for there to be feedback. And if I don't get any feedback, I don't know how to get any better. And I, of course, I, you know, at, in one level, I think I'm like the best thing since bread butter. But I know that my presentation could be improved. So please leave me a comment. Let me know what I can do to make it a better show. Uh, this is Nikos RPG on Twitch. And this has been Game Master Soapbox. Talk to you again next time. Have a great night.